Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It looks like we've got um, people still joining as we speak, which is great. Um, as I said, I'm Jake Smith. I am our uh, content manager here at Crunch, um, and uh, I'm joined by Bobby Grant, our head of accounting. Um, what we're going to cover today, as the uh, as the slide says, is IR35. What do you need to do to prepare? So I'm sure everyone has heard of IR35 uh, and is aware of how important it is uh, and how it could affect them. Uh, we're going to try and demystify it all for you today. Um, I know that we've got mostly its uh, crunch clients attending, but we do have some people who aren't uh, yet crunch clients today, uh, and so. Uh, you know, if there's anything in there that you that, that you don't understand or that you want to know more about, you can obviously give us a call, uh, speak to our advisors. They'll be able to uh, to explain to you how Crunch can help. But uh, this, as I said, this webinar is uh, is going to be hosted by Bobby. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Bobby, our head of accounting. Okay, thank you, Jake. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the purpose of the webinar today is to highlight the changes to IR35 legislation, uh, which are due to be implemented in April 2020, so not far away. Uh, and we'll also touch throughout the uh, webinar on what you need to do to prepare, so some practical suggestions to help you. Uh, I'll also provide some context to these changes and remind you about the overall purpose of the IR35 legislation, which has in fact been around for uh, something like 20 years. So this is not new legislation, it's just being updated um, based on some uh, recent uh, you know, proclamations from HMRC. We've had a lot of questions about IR35 already, uh, so what I'll try to do throughout the webinar and the individual slides is seek to answer some of the questions that have already landed. Um, so we, we'll make sure that I highlight that as, as I go along. But please, as Jake said, um, submit questions throughout the webinar and we'll do our best to respond. So here's the, the agenda for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I have around um, 19 or 20 slides, so a lot to get through. Uh, I'll give you some general context, as I said, to IR35. I'll cover the new rules in a little bit of a, in a little bit of detail and what you need to do uh, with your existing private sector assignments. I think it's important that I highlight the uh, available tools to you from HMRC online, which is known as the Check of Employment Status Tool. I'll talk a little bit about what the, the uh, future holds for the assignments you're working on at the moment. We've had some specific questions about overseas clients and how you should deal with those. This is a complex area, but I'll do my best to give you a crunch interpretation. Then I'll take you through some of the, the IR35 tests that HMRC looks to carry out when it carries out an investigation into individual personal service companies. And then I'll close with some breaking news and some remarks about how Crunch can help you and your personal service company. So a quick recap on IR35. The legislation was in, introduced in 2000. What the legislation is designed to do is to make sure that workers and employers pay the right amount of employment taxes. And that's aimed to remove any differences between employed workers and the self-employed who are in the face of it undertaking similar work. It especially affects contractors or workers providing services through an intermediary. And that's usually a personal service company, uh, which is in fact a limited company. You'll also hear terms such as disguised employment or off-payroll working rules. These are all substitutes for IR35, so you'll hear that from time to time. Importantly, the rules on who decides the IR35 status of an assignment, which were introduced for the public sector in April 2017, are now being implemented in the private sector from the 6th of April 2020, an important date that you need to be aware of. Um, I must say from the outset, it's a complex area and case law is still emerging and you'll see the outcome of tribunals uh, with different outcomes um, in the press at the moment. If I was to put all that in a diagram, uh, I would do it this way. If you start on the left-hand side, uh, you will look at the owner of a limited company or the worker who's providing services through a personal services company. There will be a contract between the PSC and the end user, 
uh, the client, the engager, and that could be an agency who sits between the end client and the personal service company. So there will be a contract for services between the PSC and the end client. Now, importantly, what HMRC will look for is the curved line there between the owner worker and the end client. Uh, they will take the personal service company out of the equation and look at what they call the hypothetical contract. So how would that worker be assessed if the personal service company wasn't there? Are they carrying out the same duties as an employee would, or are they in fact you know, an independent contractor providing services to the end client? So that, that's in a diagram what HMRC seeks to do when it assesses any IR35 contract or working assignment. So why is IR35 important? Uh, in simple terms, an employed worker under a PAYE arrangement will pay more in income tax and national insurance than a self-employed contractor working through an intermediary. That's a very broad statement, but in simple terms, that's the situation we find ourselves in today. The end client pays employers national insurance for every employee at 13.8%. It doesn't pay any national insurance as an employer for a worker who is self-employed. Thinking about it from the contractor's perspective, they can extract a profit from the limited company using any tax-efficient combination of salary and dividends they like. And they can also build up significant retained profit in the limited company for future distribution. So this is why IR35 is important. In terms of the changes that are coming in, I have two slides to take you through. Uh, so just again a reminder, this all happens from 6th of April next year. And at that time, the private and public sector arrangements will be largely harmonised. There are some subtle differences that I'll take you through now. Importantly, the end client and not the personal service company will now determine the IR35 status of an assignment. So they will decide the status of an individual worker working on an assignment. There is an exemption uh, for any private sector end clients who are considered to be small. Uh, these won't be affected by the changes. Now, the uh, criteria for a small um, organisation follows broadly the Companies Act definition of a small company, uh, which is annual turnover of less than about £10 million, a balance sheet total of less than about £5 million, and less than 50 employees. So you can see that the new rules are directed firmly at medium and large-sized organisations. Um, importantly, there is no such exemption for the public sector. Uh, so that means regardless of size, these rules will continue to apply. So in a little bit more detail, what do these changes mean uh, going forwards? Uh, so the end client is now responsible for issuing something called a status determination statement or an SDS. Now what that SDS must include is the worker's employment, uh, status following an IR35 assessment. Are they inside IR35? Are they outside IR35? That, that's in, in, in very simple terms what the statement will say. And it also must set out the reasons for reaching the employment status conclusion. And again, that's important so that the end worker can, can review the reasons behind the status determination statement. Uh, this means that the end client is now responsible for the deduction and payment of all employment taxes. So that means for the avoidance of doubt, income tax, employee national insurance, and employers national insurance. When an agency is involved in a labour supply chain, which it often is for our personal service companies, then they become the fee payer. Um, and again, that's a, a term that you will see in the HMRC guidance surrounding the new rules. Uh, so the agency is responsible for the deduction and payment of all employment taxes. You may be aware that there's currently a 5% expenses allowance for personal service companies uh, working on assignments uh, inside IR35. This will now be removed going forwards. And again, that harmonizes with the arrangements in the public sector. So what do you do about your existing private sector assignments? Uh, so until March 2020, uh, the personal service company will still be responsible for determining the IR35 status of its assignments. So the personal service company now should be taking steps to under understand the IR35 status of those existing assignments and should carry out reviews of each contract and the working practices surrounding 
the assignment. As new contracts are entered into and continue after April 2020, it's really important that you as a personal service company find out what the end client is doing to introduce these new rules. Um, so you must ask your end client what they're doing to provide these status determination statements, what they're doing to establish an appeals process if you don't agree with the SDS decision and the new rules allow for this appeals process. You must ask them what they're doing to account for tax liabilities and submitting the information via HMRC real-time information system. So again, understand what's going on surrounding the deduction of employment taxes. And an important point, uh, quite subtle this, um, it's what they're doing to pay you for work done after uh, 5th of April. So that's work in the lead up to the end of March that's paid for after the, first, uh, the 5th of April. This is important because the legislation bites from the 6th of April and if they make a payment after the 6th of April for work done in March, then they should be deducting employment taxes if it's inside IR35. So there's a, there's a lot to think about in terms of how your personal service company now engages with your end client around understanding how these new rules are going to be introduced in practice. And also find out if the small business exemption applies to your end client. In that case, your PSC will still be responsible for the um, IR35 determination. I said I would say a few words about the online tool that HMRC has published over the last couple of years. It's known the Check of Employment Status Tool, or CEST. And what you can do with that tool is uh, review the status of your existing assignments, uh, just running through a few simple questions uh, over the contractual aspects of your assignment and the working practices as well. And the, the, the tool will give you an outcome whether you're inside or outside IR35 or whether more information is needed and, and you can't come to a view based on the information provided. Um, HMRC recognises the tool needs to be updated and the latest I've heard on that is that that will happen by the end of 2019, uh, but obviously we're getting towards that time now, um, so we haven't seen any changes to the tool uh, as yet. But hopefully that will be updated to be a little more sophisticated as the private sector assignments are run through it. Importantly, HMRC says it will stand by the outcome of the CEST assessment unless its own compliance check finds that the information input into the tool isn't accurate. But this is a a grey area based on recent tribunals and, and, and it's difficult to see whether the outcome will be stood by or not by HMRC. So again, still emerging case law around this, uh, so watch this space. If you're in doubt about any of this, I would recommend that you seek a specialist review of your assignment contract and working practices. Your accountant can do that or seek advice from an employment specialist. And this will help prove that you've taken reasonable care to establish the IR35 status of your assignments, where your personal service company is still required to provide that uh, determination. And it's worth remembering that even after uh, 6th of April, HMRC can still look back and investigate you at the personal service company level. Uh, so again, it's important you understand precisely the status of each assignment you've entered into. Uh, looking ahead, I've got a couple of slides on your future assignments uh, and importantly, how information is going to be shared um, across the labour supply chain. So from the outset, the IR35 determination and its rationale, which I mentioned in one of the previous slides, it must be cascaded to all of the parties in the labour supply chain. Um, so there's a status determination statement which must say the end client provides the SDS directly to the PSE worker. All parties in the labour supply chain must cascade that statement to the next contractual party and all of this must happen before the first payment is made to the PSC worker. Uh, HMRC recognises that there are often lengthy and complex supply chains and there is a shortcut that the end client would simply inform the fee payer, which may be the agency, and the worker directly of the SDS statement. Importantly, the responsibility for preparing that SDS remains with the end client because they're the one that knows the working practices and they're the ones that knows the, the basis of the contract. There's also the uh, duty of reasonable care when carrying out these assessments. Um, and what that means in practice is that the, uh, the end client must take independent legal advice uh, when it provides the SDS, and it must make a full assessment on an individual basis. Uh, so you can see that there are serious resource implications for businesses 
who use personal service companies heavily to carry out individual assessments for each ass assignment uh, that it enters into. The appeals process is going to be client-led, um, so that means the personal service company raises concerns it may have to the end client, um, and that includes the outcome of the ASDS assessment. So if you disagree with it, you raise it with your end client. The end client then considers the evidence that you provide as the PSC, and then it will provide a written response to you with the outcome. All that should happen within a 45-day um, planning horizon, uh, from raising the concern to actually issuing uh, the outcome of the, the, the appeal uh, conclusion. A few, as a PSC, still disagree. Uh, what HMRC says is that you can attempt to reclaim tax and national insurance overpaid via something called the end of year HMRC procedures. It's completely uh, vague on how this will operate in practice, uh, so we're a bit unsure about that. It may well be you have to inform S uh, HMRC that you're in dispute with a client and you're uh, currently not handing over uh, tax and national insurance. Again, I think we need to see more detail on that, but it's in the guidance published by HMRC, so I thought I would bring it to your attention. Now, we've had a couple of questions about overseas clients and how that, uh, that may operate going forward, so I've got a couple of slides on that. Um, all I can say is that this is an extremely complex area of HMRC guidance, and I've actually put on the slide what the guidance says in, in the italicised uh, words there. I won't read that out, um, but what HMRC is getting at in terms of uh, what it says here is that the legislation does apply to overseas companies and they intend to treat these overseas, overseas companies as UK residents for the purposes of issuing the status determination statement and deducting the relevant taxes. How this is going to be enforced, uh, we just do not know yet, and I believe that's yet to be established. Um, so HMRC guidance, as I say in the final remark there, is less than clear. However, if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll give you our interpretation of what that uh, may mean. So, if you have an overseas end client which engages a UK-based PSE directly, it's the overseas client which determines the IR35 status of the assignment and issues the SDS. When an agency in, is involved, the agency will be responsible for issuing the SDS from the end client based on its determination, um, and, and they will pass that on to the worker and the personal service company. If the UK-based PAC is paid on a gross basis directly by the end client, i.e. no taxes are deducted at all, it could be argued that the PSC now becomes the fee payer, and it needs to account for the UK employment taxes. But frankly, we really do not know, so you need to seek expert advice in any scenario where an overseas client is not providing a status determination statement or is not deducting employment taxes. So you need to look at each case on its merits. There is no blanket um, sort of answer to these questions. If the fee payer is an overseas based agency and the end client is overseas, it appears that the fee payer, i.e. the agency, will deduct the employment taxes. But if the end client is the fee payer and it's based in the UK, but with maybe overseas premises, etc., it's the end client which pays the employment taxes. So that's a relatively simple scenario. So bringing all that together, if you have overseas clients, you know, please find out how they are implementing these new rules. And it's important that you review your contracts and working practices in these scenarios with your overseas clients. And please seek expert advice if you can. I think it's also worth just reminding you of what HMRC looks for if it decides to investigate any of your uh, assignments at the PSC level. So the main factors are on the left-hand side of this slide. Uh, so we'll look firstly at whether there's a, a personal service involved in the contract. So that we'll see whether you can send in a substitute or whether, whether you can assign parts of the contract to other parties. Um, so is this a contract for services? i.e. self-employed, or is it a contract of service, i.e. employed? So that's an important factor that HMRC will look into. There are secondary factors underneath that that help with the overall conclusion, and those are in the, the right-hand side of the slide. It will also look into control. So who controls the assignment? Who decides when the work is carried out? Uh, for instance, is it during a working day? Or, or can you, as the personal service company, carry out the work at any time? Uh, where do you carry it out? Do you have to go to a client premises or can you carry it out from your own offices? 
uh, what you do day to day. Uh, so does the end client direct you or are you free to choose how you deliver the assignment and how you do it? Uh, you know, is the client telling you, you know, how you should uh, actually deliver the services that, that are being provided? The secondary factors underneath that are the basis of payment. Uh, for instance, do you have to submit a timesheet that would suggest you're an employee, or do you submit a monthly invoice from your company, or a single invoice at the end of the uh, at the end of the assignment, which would sort of indicate uh, that you are outside IR35. And it will also look uh, at aspects: are you part and parcel of the management arrangements of the organisation? So, do you have responsibilities to line manage people? Uh, do you, in fact, have a line manager day to day? Uh, so, we'll look at those sorts of indicators of employment. And finally, mutually, mutuality of obligation. Uh, so, in terms of contractually, must you accept more work if the client offers it? Um, and do you have to write? Do you have the right to terminate the contract at any time, or is there a lengthy uh, period of termination that you need to follow in terms of a notice period and so on? So those are all indicators um, of whether uh, an assignment is inside IR35 or outside. Uh, we had another question uh, in advance of the, the webinar, and that's um, the retrospective application of these new rules. Um, so. Our reading of the, the guidance is that HMRC will un undertake investigations at the end client level under the new rules, so it won't be at the PSC level at all. And HMRC has said uh, that it will only apply the rules retrospectively in the cases of suspected fraud or criminal behaviour. Um, however, a huge caveat in this is that the position does remain unclear uh, where PSCs haven't applied the rules correctly in prior years, and I guess that will only be proved by the emergence of tribunal cases and the outcomes of those going forward. Uh, I said I would uh, pick up some latest news. Uh, you may have seen this in the contractor press, uh, but in August this year, HMRC wrote to around 1,500 contractors uh, who worked for GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, these letters asked the contractors to confirm their employment status and to notify HMRC about the outcome. Uh, this, in our eyes, is the first example of the investigate one end client and catch many personal service companies approach from HRC firmly in action. Uh, you'll also be aware that some major banks have announced that they will be dealing with PSCs going forwards and that all workers will be on payroll from April 2020. Um, and you will be aware that the HMRC record at Tribunal is still patchy, to say the least, in terms of its success in, in bringing cases against personal service companies and trying to recover employment taxes. In terms of my closing remarks, um, I've said really throughout this uh, webinar uh, that you must start talking to your end clients and your agencies about how these new rules are going to be implemented and how your assignment is classified going forward. You also need to understand the impact on your net income uh, once employment taxes are accounted for. But I would say if you're working across multiple clients and different assignments, uh, these changes shouldn't really be feared. Uh, try and use your own terms and control the assignments as, as much as you can. You can still operate your limited company. Um, it's expected that you will work on some assignments which are inside IR35 and others which are outside IR35, and we have a, an accountancy solution, accountancy solution uh, which can help your company and you going forward. And remember, if you disagree with your end client status determination statement, you can ensure that you raise this formally via the appeals process. Uh, so you can seek your own specialist review of the assignment. Uh, Crunch can do this for you, and you can use that as evidence uh, in providing a case towards your end client when you launch an appeal. In terms of what Crunch can do to help you now, uh, on our website we do have an IR35 calculator, uh, so that's a good start to put, starting point for you to help assess your risk of being inside IR35. We also have business protect insurance for our clients and that can cover you against legal costs, including the costs of any investigation uh, around IR35 uh, that HMRC may decide to launch into your personal service company. That's actually included for our Plus Package clients. Uh, very shortly, we'll be upgrading our calculator to collect more information from you about your individual assignments in the light of these changes. 
and we'll also be launching a uh, specialist insurance uh, uh, for you to protect yourself against any claims from paid tax if our tool uh, when it's published has assessed you as outside IR35 and HMRC finds the assignment to be inside IR35 so that's a really important development for our customers. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we still uh, provide comprehensive IR35 reviews of your individual assignment contract and working practices. And just a reminder that if you are a Crunch Plus package client, uh, one review is included in your annual fee. We will also be introducing an enhanced Plus package, and that uh, enables you to keep your limited company trading while you work on contracts inside and outside of IR35. And you can also use our Crunch Umbrella service when you need it. For those of you on our basic package, yeah, you can select any additional service you, you require uh, to work inside and outside of IR35 rules, and that includes an IR35 payroll, um, a limited company accounting for contracts inside IR35, and we also have our Crunch Umbrella service, which works with a range of agencies and we have a whole IR35 hub on our website uh, at crunch.co.uk forward slash IR35. So that's the end of the uh, remarks from me in terms of this webinar. Uh, what Jake and I will do now is we'll dip into some of your questions and try and provide some responses as far as we can in terms of the sort of general uh, themes that are coming out. So we'll have a look at those now and give you some responses as quickly as we can. Okay, great. Um, there are a few questions about um, whether these were going to be retrospective. A few of them did come in before um, Bobby did his slide on whether they're retrospective. Um, so I hope that, that people feel that those are, are answered. Um, there was a question about the difference um, between or rather, what I think the question was getting at was about the difference between employment status for tax and whether you're employed and get employment rights, um, which I think is quite a complicated area, isn't it, Bobby? Is yeah. it, we are talking here about your employment status for tax. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It is around the, the, the employment tax uh, status of the assignment. There is a lot going on um, around uh, you know rights for employees. Uh, some of you may have heard something called the Taylor Report, uh, which was a, a report published by the government uh, oh, about 18 months ago now, and that was looking at the you know the benefits afforded to, to workers on things like zero-hour contracts and so on, and whether they have entitlement to, to benefits in the same way as an employee um, is entitled. I think what you'll see going forward is a, a harmonisation of you know your status as an employee for tax and your status as an employee for, for other benefits. I think that's that's the way uh, government legislation is going. But in terms of IR35, it's very firmly around the tax position of your assignment. Okay, thank you, Bobby. Um, there's been a couple of uh, questions in here about what um, our opinion or what do we think will happen? So do we think that uh, there are going to be blanket decisions and what do we think might happen to rates? Uh, so we haven't got a crystal ball, but um, what happened in the public sector? Yeah, in terms of the public sector, um, I wouldn't use the, the term blanket assessments um, because there is a requirement um, to look at each assignment individually. Uh, so I think we'll see a strengthening of that going forwards. Uh, so we shouldn't really see any blanket assessments. What we are seeing, however, as I mentioned in, in one of my slides, is that some major organisations are simply deciding not to engage personal service companies and they are taking people onto the payroll. And that's the major banks uh, that you may have seen. Now, I think the uh, reasoning behind that is mainly around the highly regulated nature of the banking industry and, and making sure that you are at all times on the right side of regulators. So I suspect that would be more uh, around making sure that uh, all regulations are followed closely and accurately, uh, rather than a, a sort of blanket assessment approach at all. Um, but going forward, you, you, you are uh, entitled to have an individual status determination statement. It should not be a blanket assessment. Okay. Um, there was a, 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 a question here that I think um, we can, we always try and be jargon free, um, but someone is saying, rightfully, inside R35 and outside R35 is rather jargony. Um, 
what we the the, the R thirty five rules exist, uh, and yeah. when we say inside R thirty five rules, it means that you have been caught by the rules and therefore should be paying employment taxes. And if you are outside R thirty five rules, it means that you're effectively you you are a contractor you are self-employed uh, and therefore your company is allowed to be paid gross and for you to take the money out of that company in whichever way you choose so by inside and outside 35 r35 we simply mean have the rules caught you if the rules have caught you someone somewhere needs to be paying the correct employment taxes that, that's exactly right um you're inside r35 you're regarded as an employee uh, for in terms of your uh, tax status outside r35 uh, you're self-employed and you can run the gross payment through your limited company in the normal way actually just following on uh, uh, i didn't answer the question about what do i think will happen to rates um, you know, we did see in the public sector that in around 25% of cases uh, there was a, an increase in the day rate, um, so, so that was based on a, a survey that was carried out, so that, that's not in fact uh, that high a proportion. Um, whether that's carried out uh, through to the, uh, the private sector, it, it's hard to tell, um, but if you want to see your net take-home uh, income, uh, remain at the same level then you're going to have to negotiate an increase in your day rate okay um, and that's partly as a result of the uh, employment taxes or mostly as a result of the yeah. employment taxes that need to be paid uh, especially the national insurance and also as a result of potentially removing the uh, ability to claim certain expenses that's right uh, and indeed the end client may take a view that uh, they're incurring uh, more costs because of the 13.8 percent employer national insurance contribution uh, so, so they may actually try and seek a, a reduction in day rates to cover that uh, it's um, a bit unknown at the moment uh, but that is also a possibility i guess okay um going back to there's been a number of questions about the sort of status declaration statement um and how um a psc is meant to know for example the, the turnover or the size of a company um so uh, just if clarify if 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 they're working for a larger or medium-sized company the assumption is that, that that company has to make this status determination statement um, if it's a smaller company you do need to ask the questions to ensure that they really are a smaller company so that is about the, the, the turnover and uh, yes energy. yes that, that, that's exactly right and, and what, what this is going to uh, mean is that, is that you need to have a a fairly open conversation with your end client um, before an assignment starts uh, so that you uh, are quite clear on whether the status determination statement needs to be issued uh, by the end client or whether you remain responsible as a personal service company for assessing the IR35 status of the assignment uh, so that, that's relatively straightforward. Okay um, we've got a few questions about things like length of service whether length or oh, sorry not length of service length of contract uh, may affect whether you're inside or outside um, can you give us any insight on that Bobby? yeah it's a secondary factor uh, that the HMRC may look at so for instance if you uh, were working for the same client for maybe two years uh, that, that would suggest uh, that, that you may well be uh, more of an employee rather than self-employed. Uh, so that, that's not a blanket statement, it's just that it may well be an indicator uh, that you're an, you're an employee. So the length of engagement uh, is considered uh, as part of the overall assessment that, that may, be, may be carried out. Okay, and we've also had a number of questions. I'm not going to ask one of them in any detail because um, we're trying to be slightly more general with our questions rather than addressing people's individual situations. But there have been a f quite a few questions where they're saying that their PSC is actually contracted by consultants who work for large end clients, or there might be companies in between rather than necessarily an agency. So, how does the situation work in like? Okay. Yeah, in a situation where you have a lengthy or complex labour supply chain, uh, the, um, the status determination statement must always be issued by the end client and then it cascades throughout the labour supply chain. Um, so it has been mooted that, uh, you know, why would 
uh, an end client, not just set up a, a very small satellite company with a couple of million turnover and employ loads of personal service companies. The uh, you know HMRC is is absolutely right that this that this will not happen. It's the size of the end client which matters, and it's up to them to issue the statements. Okay. Um, uh, there are a few questions about umbrella companies, uh, and I, I guess um, not everyone will necessarily understand what an umbrella company is. Can you give a, a very brief explanation of how an umbrella company might be useful for workers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Crunch has a, an umbrella company, and, and what that means is that uh, an end client uh, will go to an agency. Uh, and it, it's looking for workers for a, you know, a, a, a very specified uh, period of time. You become an employee of the umbrella company. Uh, so we will be responsible for deducting all the employment taxes and passing those over to HMRC uh, uh, through the RTI system. Uh, so it's very much a relationship of employee uh, and employer, uh, the employer being the umbrella company. Uh, but at the end of the day, the usually with an umbrella company that has then lost you the ability to take money out as dividends and things like that oh absolutely yeah yeah you're paid on, on a net basis uh, it's salary uh, usually based on a weekly timesheet that you submit to your uh, end client so it's a it's a solution for people who are inside ir35 yes indeed yeah yeah. Okay. Um, we have got lots more questions we're going to make sure that we sort of collate these questions uh, uh, get answers for them all and publish them for the people who have attended. We will make sure that there is an article that has got the questions that have been asked and an answer. Again, if it's about an individual situation, you really need to speak uh, to us individually rather than um, uh, via this webinar. Uh, and we will also definitely make sure that the recording of the webinar and the slides from the webinar are made available to all of our Crunch clients and anyone else who's attended today. Um, I'd encourage everyone to uh, look at our R35 hub on the Crunch website, which is crunch.co.uk slash IR35. Um, that has links to uh, all of our articles, explains the, you know, what's going on, has links to our calculator, as well as uh, a downloadable business guide explaining R35 in more detail. We will make sure that this recording and the slides also get added to the R35 hub. Uh, Bobby, are there any other questions that you think would be good to try and pick up today? Uh, so just uh, one caught my eye there, and it was around um, if you let me just read it. It's uh, if I keep a timesheet for my client to prove that I haven't worked X amount of hours, will that put me inside IR35? Um, I, I mean, it's it's not a, a, a yes and no answer uh, to, to a, at the detail level like that. Uh, what HMRC will look at, and, and indeed what your end client will look at, is in the round. Um, so a timesheet may be perfectly acceptable for uh, certain reasons. Um, but it's really the, the, the emphasis of the whole contract and the general working practices as well that will be looked at. Uh, so a timesheet is just one small factor in all of that. Yeah, I think that's one of the important things to say here, that, that we, we had the slide on the R35 test. It's a combination of all of those things. There is no magic bullet uh, to avoid being um, inside R35. Uh, there were also a number of questions, Bobby, just on the sort of the, the substitution and financial risk for a company. So um, if we, maybe just a little bit more elaboration on those points. Yes, usually you would see contractually um, with, with an end client that you're able to send a substitute um, if you weren't able to uh, provide the services for any reason. Uh, and indeed, if you have sent a substitute at any time, uh, that's, a, that's a really good indicator uh, that, you, that you're self-employed and, and outside of, of IR35. Um, so that, that's an important factor to, uh, to keep in mind as well. Okay, great. Right, well... Well, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. It's been one of our most popular uh, webinars. I think we had over 300 people uh, at one point, um, and we still have 230 of you. So thank you very much for listening all to the end. Um, as we said before, you can always speak to your current client managers uh, about any of your concerns for individual um, 
uh, information uh, and the, the, the client managers are all well trained on this and they also obviously uh, can ask more complex or detailed questions of our, all of our accountants including Bobby. Um, the slides will be available shortly so I think that's about it from us. So Bobby I'd like to thank you for your time today and thank you everyone for listening. You're welcome, my pleasure. Um, have a good day everyone. Thank you.